It's now 4.20, so it's the uh, official starting time. It feels awfully like beer o'clock already to me, but perhaps we can, as a group, stick out one more presentation before we uh, get our reward. So this talk will be about deferred work in the Linux kernel. I thank you for coming to attend at this uh, late hour, and I thank the organizers for accepting this proposal. I'll say that all the demo code is at this GitHub repo. You should be able to download these demos and run them yourself, should you choose to do so. And the latest version of these uh, slides, uh, including any corrections I make due to errors people point out during the presentation, will be at this URL, which actually is HTTP, HTTP rather than HTTPS. So with that, let's launch into the technical discussion. Uh, deferred work is a common pattern in software engineering. It's not unique to the Linux kernel. Uh, it's inconvenient or inappropriate to perform some kind of uh, callback uh, function for one reason or another very often. And so the operating system cues it for uh, performance later. For purposes of this talk, at least, there are two kinds of deferred work. I guess there's no pointer thing here. Oh, well. Um, there's work that is uh, waiting that is delayed because a resource it needs, like memory, processor time, a lock, a message, uh, is unavailable. And then there is work that is queued that is performed in response to an event that occurs, classically a hard IRQ, but perhaps a, just a timer expiration or, um, or some device driver uh, requesting uh, work to be done later. So these is at a general level what deferred work is. Let's talk about what deferred work is in Linux. The two primary performers of deferred work in Linux for many years are uh, soft IRQs, also known as bottom halves. Uh, in the soft IRQ code in the kernel, you very often see underscore BH underscore, and that stands for bottom half, which is uh, what Unix called uh, its equivalents of soft IRQs before Linux even existed. And then uh, the other uh, long-standing performer of deferred work, which is actually quite different than soft IRQs, are work queues whose executors are called K-workers. And why might you get interested in these topics uh, if you, like me, are the maintainer and uh, caretaker of a Linux kernel and a robotics project? And the answer is these uh, kernel components find you in the form of bug tickets. There are two major ways in which deferred work can go wrong. Uh, one is that while work can be deferred for a while, it can't be deferred forever. A uh, notable case of work being deferred for too long is RCU stalls. RCU is read copy update. It is basically the kernel's garbage uh, collector for uh, memory that is no longer in use. Obviously, uh, garbage collection doesn't have to run uh, right after memory uh, could be freed. But if it never runs, then what you have is oom. Uh, another symptom of uh, work being delayed too long is that when there is a storm of network packets coming into the device, your user space application just completely uh, falls over. Uh, in contrast to tasks being deferred for too long, you can have the situation that your performers of deferred work get on the CPU and just run and run and run and run, and they don't let user space make progress. So you can see uh, K-workers or the executor of uh, software queues, k software QD, just uh, sit on the cores. Or ironically, you can see a K-worker watchdog fire because a particular work queue isn't yielding the processor. And I'm going to show uh, some examples of these uh, problems in the upcoming slides. So uh, the difficulty with these situations is they've been traditionally hard to investigate. 
and they've been hard to fix even when you develop theories as to uh, what's going wrong. Uh, in fact, uh, software cues and work cues have the reputation for being a little bit inscrutable and uh, hard to understand. And uh, that these re this reputation has been largely well-deserved, I would have to say, in general. But the point of this presentation is essentially to open this window and to give you some tools to investigate these kernel functions and to some extent do something about them. So with that, let's talk about soft IR cues. Um, soft IR cues have been in the kernel apparently since the 2.3 series. I gave an earlier version of this talk and somebody asked me what is the best documentation for soft IR cues. And actually I found it's Robert Love's 2010 book called Linux Kernel Development, um, while the actual callback functions that perform the work of software queues have changed during this time period. The core API for software queues is really about the same uh, as it was in 2010, and Robert Love is a, a great writer, so I recommend that book. Uh, the part, on the other hand, uh, work queues, as I will describe, have changed a great deal, and so uh, for the most part, the discussion of work cues in that book is, is kind of uh, gathered some uh, dust. But anyhow, let's launch into soft IR cues. Let's start off by talking about what they are. There are 10 delicious flavors of soft IR cues. They're listed here in the order that they appear in the kernel. So when K soft IR QD runs and it comes along and starts uh, executing soft IR cues, it does first high, the high priority ones, then some timers, then some network uh, callbacks, uh, block devices, IRQ poll, which is essentially um, NAPI, if you know what that is, um, for uh, storage devices. The most numerous soft IRQs are actually uh, tasklets, which are used by a lot of device drivers. Uh, there are scheduler soft IRQs, uh, HR timer soft IR queues and RCU soft IR queues, as I already mentioned. Without studying soft IR queues a great deal, you may notice that network receipt soft IR queues are higher priority than HR timer soft IR queues. And that already is kind of a hint that there, there could be problems. Um, we could reorder these if we wanted, but that would be an ABI break and uh, p potentially be unpleasant, say, to uh, uh, out-of-tree uh, device drivers for those who, who care about uh, things like that. So uh, it sounds like a great design in general to have a callback associated with a hard IRQ that performs the uh, lengthier work associated with that event. But in fact, I would have to say that Soft IR queues are not the kernel's most beloved feature. Uh, here are some money quotes from famous uh, Linux kernel maintainers about soft IR queues. This one, soft IR queues are often a pain to deal with, appears in the kernel's official documentation. So it's not just my opinion, it's actually a fact. Uh, here is a quote from Frederick Weisfecker, who is a Linux kernel uh, fellow who said people fight hard through this big soft IRQ lock. Here Frederick is making a reference to the big kernel lock, which took years and years to remove from the kernel. Uh, why are soft IRQs like the uh, big kernel lock? The answer is that it's a well-established principle in software engineering that a lock uh, taking and a lock release should immediately surround the data that the lock is protecting. Uh, you want to hold the lock for the minimum time possible. Uh, we are not following this principle with soft IRQs. There's a function called local bottom half disable that I'll talk more about in a moment. And it is scattered all over the kernel. And uh, people do not know really what data it's protecting. And uh, this makes it very hard to change. And then finally, the dean of real-time Linux Thomas Gleishner has said that software, uh, software IRQ processing prevents the kernel to control it. 
and the heuristics people have added are disgusting. So uh, if you can steal yourself, I'm going to show you now the disgusting heuristics, which are in a file called kernel software q.c. Uh, and the heuristics are these two. One describes the uh, time slice that uh, the uh, software queue processing will use in any one go. And then the second one describes the number of times that the kernel will go through that list of 10 software queues before it yields the processor. So uh, you probably know about Linux, that it runs on teeny IoT devices, and it runs on supercomputers. And so you, you might ask, why are these numbers, which are compiled into the kernel and not dynamically set by the scheduler, ideal for both supercomputers and, say, lawn sprinklers? And the answer is, it's hard to believe that they are. So we have the incredibly sophisticated schedulers um, we have this new EV, EEVDF scheduler. Um, we are taking the power of those algorithms away and compiling these numbers in, but people just are frankly too uh, afraid to change them. So uh, let's talk a little bit more about how, case, how software queues work uh, or don't work. Um, this is, diagram is in... Uh, intended to describe the actual mechanism. We have a hard IRQ. The software IRQ management code checks if a software IRQ is already running on that core. So case software QD, which executes um, software IRQs, is a kernel per CPU thread. This local bottom half disable big software IRQ lock uh, is protecting data that's local to each core. If the hard IRQ interrupts a soft IRQ, then a new soft IRQ cannot start. So the ideal situation uh, is when the hard IRQ happens, if no soft IRQ, whoops, if no soft IRQ is running, then you go immediately to this do soft IRQ function that executes soft IRQ. This uh, path is called the piggyback. It's great when it happens. The, uh, in uh, voluntary preemption kernels, the IR hard IRQ is running an interrupt context, and the soft IRQ runs an interrupt context, and all is great, and then whatever was running before resumes. The problem is, if a soft IRQ was interrupted by the hard IRQ, then you have to wait for K soft IRQ D to run. K soft IRQ D does not run an interrupt context, it is a kernel thread, which is managed by the scheduler. Um, it's great that the scheduler is managing this thread, but it rolls up all 10 of those soft IRQs and is just this kind of black box. Um, it, the situation is even more painful in real-time kernels because, of course, in real-time kernels, the hard IRQ is itself a thread. It is running in process context and it doesn't make any sense for the soft IRQ to run uh, immediately after it. It's just another thread. So um, the delay here uh, can, can be for a while uh, because uh, K soft IRQD traditionally runs in SCED other with uh, low priority. So uh, in, in RT uh, in particular, this situation is painful and there are ongoing efforts to improve it, which I will describe in a moment. But first, I wanted to look at the question, how can we tell what KSoft IRQ do, is actually doing? So here I have, um, I just have some scripts in this GitHub repo um, that can give some information about that. Um, the uh, best method I've found to really investigate uh, KSoft IRQ D is just the um, stack count uh, Python script that comes with libbpf. Here I am going to use it to trace the function do software queue, uh, which uh, this is a live demo, so here are some live warnings. Uh, what's happening now is libllvm is compiling some B, uh, bpf 
It's submitting it to the validator inside the kernel and the uh, virtual machine inside the kernel is uh, actually executing it and outputting this data. So what stack count outputs is counts uh, here at the bottom of different stacks that end in the execution of this function do soft IRQ. So you can see uh, how soft, uh, do soft IRQ and soft IRQs are occurring on the system. So here we see an example of the piggyback. There's an IRQ when it finishes, uh, it enables soft IRQs and do soft IRQ runs. Uh, and if we scroll through this, here we see, um, okay, soft IRQD was running a soft IRQ. And even in this case, you can't really tell what K soft IRQD is doing because uh, the scheduler is just uh, running it. So um, just for fun, I've made a, a um, BPF, BPF trace script that spies on uh, soft IRQs and uh, is just outputting uh, on which core, which soft IRQ is running. And uh, here you can see, uh, here you can see sometimes they take a long time, and this is where the source of this difficulty comes from. So uh, while I had fun making my own scripts, um, the real class way to investigate soft IRQs going forward that I would recommend you learn about tomorrow in the room next door is the tool RTLA that Daniel Bristow de Oliveira has created this is um, a fairly new tool. Uh, it, RTLA, whoops, is kind of um, misleading and that you might think RT is real time, but actually it's the runtime latency analyzer. It will work but with voluntary preemption kernels. It uh, combines the best features of F-trace and cyclic test, which may sound like faint praise, but actually I, I uh, mean that as a compliment in this particular case. It is a very lightweight tool because it is using trace points. And so uh, you could run it all the time, I think, in production uh, as kind of a black box data recorder and dump out data uh, that shows uh, what soft IRQs, for example, are doing when you're having a problem with your user space applications. So um, this tool is really nice, but I'm not going to demonstrate it or or talk more about it because Daniel, who wrote it, will be speaking tomorrow. So with that, I would like to talk a little bit about uh, the various ways that you can adjust software queues and uh, what prospects there are for future progress. There is a kernel configuration parameter called uh, RCU new callback CPU. And what that actually is is a parameter that will um, take soft IRQ processing and put it in its own kernel thread. And that means that you could pin this thread on your housekeeping cores of your robotic system. You can adjust its priority. You can adjust its um, scheduler uh, variety. Uh, this uh, option has been around for a long time. Similarly, in the, since the 5.12 kernel, you can take the uh, net RX soft IRQs out of case soft IRQD and run them in their own thread and also configure them. Similarly, um, this sounds really great to have this additional amount of control, but it's worth pointing out that both RCU and the network stack have an insanely large number of tunable parameters available via SysFS. Uh, or via kconfig. Uh, in addition, there's even uh, some parameters in procfs that directly control the behavior of network soft IRQs. So, um, you know, the, put, making your own kernel threads is a little bit of a brute force solution. Um, and uh, anytime you have a new kernel thread, you have a context switch penalty associated with executing it. So, uh, if there's anything I've learned managing these systems is that you have to perform measurements 
and see which configuration changes actually make your, your system work better. Uh, it's very tempting to put everything in its own thread because it's, it's a simple solution, but it, it may make this uh, system slower. Uh, a long-running saga is that of ti timer software queues. Assuredly, if there's any callback to an interrupt that you would like to run quickly, it is the callback to a timer. Uh, and there have been a couple of attempts in the real-time kernel to pull timer software queues out into their own thread. Um, they've been not entirely successful, I would say, as far as how well they perform. Um, there are two more recent attempts to make timers uh, run in their own kernel threads in the voluntary preemption kernel, which obviously also could be used in RT. One uh, proposed in kernel 6.5 was from uh, Frederick Weisswecker, where he started trying to mark individual timers as able to run concurrently with other software queues. That unfortunately ran into locked up problems and didn't get very far. The uh, attempt to uh, get rid of bottom half disable one instance at a time that seems more promising is uh, some attempts to replace it with local scoped locks in the network stack. So this is an effort from uh, uh, Sebastian Sevier, who's right here, he gave a really great Linux uh, plumbers talk about it in 2023. All these blue texts are hyperlinks, so you can go and look at it yourself. You may not know that the kernel now has scoped locks, so you can essentially put a mutex in a driver, and you don't have to have any go-tos that release it, because when the lock goes out of scope, the kernel will release it uh, automatically. So this is great. And the idea is to replace eventually some of the calls in the network stack to local bottom half disable with actual locks surrounding the data that they're protecting, which would just be a giant step forward. Uh, finally, I'll just mention, oh, so this, this um, local scope locks, unfortunately, did not make it into 6.5 either, but I hear from Sebastian that this effort is ongoing and maybe there's hope that uh, it could be merged. And I should say the demo he showed at Plumbers shows that when you use this mechanism, priority inheritance actually works with software queues. That would be great. I would stop thinking and talking about software queues if that would happen. That would really make me happy. I've been thinking about them for a long time. But, oops, um, I just mentioned a headline feature in some sense of uh, the 6.9 kernel uh, at the end of the merge window was that the tasklets are now using the work queue API tasklet software queues, but it doesn't make sense to talk about that until after I talk about uh, work queues, which I am going to do momentarily. I'll just say to summarize this whole um, section that there are about 250 call sites for the big software queue lock, local bottom half disable. So it is quite a long-term difficult project to get rid of all of them. Um, it's possible, as I mentioned, to run uh, RCU and uh, network callbacks and in RT at the moment timers and their own threads, but doing so has a context switch penalty, so you might want to consider other methods of adjusting them. And uh, let's move on to work queues and talk about the changes to tasklets. So does anybody have a burning question before I dive into, uh, into uh, work queues? I'll take that as, as a no. I'll have put, successfully put the audience to sleep. But let's... Uh, Let's now talk about work queues. Work queues uh, function quite differently from software queues, mostly in happy, good ways. Uh, what a work queue really is, is just a linked list of uh, function pointers that describe um, work to be done. A device driver, a, a file system, a crypto engine can enqueue these work functions. Each one of the work queues belongs to one of these kernel entities. But uh, two different work queues can be associated with the same worker pool, which contains 
kernel threads that will execute this work. And here I am discussing bound per CPU work queues. So each CPU has a um, niceness zero worker pool created by the kernel at boot and a high priority nice minus 20 worker pool. And work uh, queues are matched to the pools depending on their flags uh, automatically. Uh, and a given pool can contain, a given um, queue can, can uh, contain multiple different work functions. You see this, for example, in memory management, that a whole bunch of uh, different memory management functions can be on the same work queue. So these are the bound per CPU work queues. There also are uh, unbound uh, work queues. Um, if we look at, uh, let's actually just go and look at the process table. Um, on this system. So here are uh, the key workers that are actually running on this system right now. And if we look at, uh, here's a, a typical key worker. Uh, the number after the slash here is actually the core on which it's running. The number after the colon is just uh, a, a counter, an ID. It's uh, actually not of, of any interest. Um, and uh, yeah, so uh, the, let's see, let's do this. So the, these ones with the uh, U after the slash, these are the unbound K workers. So they can run on any core. Uh, you can see uh, that the numbering of these uh, unbound K workers has gaps. So for pool 16, we have one, two, and four. There used to be a three and it went away. That's because um, unbound K workers uh, which perform persistent CPU intensive work that basically has to go on all the time, pretty much. Uh, they are, uh, well, so, so both bound and unbound K workers don't have a fixed number of workers per pool. The kernel provides them or tears them down as needed. Uh, unbound K workers also have a, a variable dynamic number of pools. Um, Bound key workers obviously uh, can't migrate. They are kernel per CPU threads. Uh, unbound ones can. That is great from the point of view of getting this long running intensive work done. But I put it in red because it also means that if you have some uh, task like logging, say, that is going on forever at some low rate that isn't at all latency sensitive, running on your housekeeping core, uh, because the uh, unbound uh, work queues that service the file system and the block devices can migrate. They can migrate to the cores where your latency sense of user space applications are running, uh, which may be surprising and unhappy to you. So um, here's an example of uh, how I got interested in the work queues. This is an actual splat from uh, DMessage where the uh, key worker watchdog uh, reported that a single work queue was persisting on the core for 207 seconds, which is a, a long time for a, a K thread. Um, this is an example, I should say, from the 515 RT kernel. The uh, D message output reported that there were three active work queues uh, on that core one for the network driver, one for EXT4 file system, and one for a device driver whose name has been redacted. Uh, these three work queues were assigned to this pool work queue 112 because they all have the byte A as in their flags, which means they all had uh, the same characteristics which caused them to be assigned together. Now, if you uh, um, were have experience working in this area, fixing these kind of kernel bugs, you might say, well, I'll 
I'll pin some thread on the housekeeping course and I'll adjust its priority and I'll change its scheduler parameters with task set or CHRT. This is kind of the usual workflow for, say, case swapty. You can put it on core zero and uh, have it not be where your latency sensitive applications are. However, that actually will not work for work queues. And this is the main message I'm uh, trying to leave you with in this part of the talk. Work queues are great. Work queues are more controllable than soft queues. Yes? Um, there is a mod for work queues? Yes, that is what I'm going to talk about. Okay, but, but yes, there, so there's a way to work with work queues, but it's not the way that you're used to. And the reason is, if you look at the um, proc PID files, there's a file called stat in this, whoops, in this uh, stat um, file, there is this bit mask, which is actually an export of uh, the flags from struct task. And uh, I created this little program that reads each file in proc PID stat and checks that bit to see if we can pin that, uh, that K worker, whoops. And in fact, you find that every single K worker is unpinnable uh, according to that bit. And you might say, you just said that all these unbound work queues can migrate. Why would they be unpinnable? That doesn't make any sense, right? If they migrate by themselves, why can't you migrate them? And so the answer is, you're doing it the wrong way. So um, in the work queue API, you do not manage the K workers. You manage the work queues. Uh, the result you end up with is that the work queues, which are these linked lists of function pointers describing the work you want done, have a CPU mask, a niceness, and a, uh, a migration affinity scope associated with them, which seems really weird. But if you think about it, who cares about kernel threads? Why do we have to think about kernel threads? What you want is this work to get done. You don't care which kernel thread executes it. So the, the great thing about work queues is that you do not manage the threads. You, you express to the work queue API what you want done, and it provides kernel threads that do the work that way. So th this is actually really great, but it's somewhat profoundly different and bewildering if you start thinking about work queues and you've previously, for example, been thinking about soft IR queues. So um, to demonstrate this, in my remaining time, I'm going to show you this uh, script that drives this point home. So this demo will not work before kernel 6.6 .6 because the, it's using the Dragon debugger and a uh, script called workqdump.py that appeared in 6.6. .6. Uh, Dragon is a new debugger from Meta. Uh, here we're listing for a randomly chosen um, work queue. Oh, we're listing um, from Sisyphus those uh, work queues which have been exported there. Most work queues, you saw all the work queues running on this system are not exported there. Of course, these uh, NVMe ones and this uh, right back one that flushes dirty pages to backing store, these are troublesome to manage and that's why they're exported you actually can export any work queue to SysFS that you want, although there'd be no profit doing it for bound work queues. But anyhow, let's look at for um, this NVMe work queue, what parameters are settable there. There's uh, three having to do with the affinity, the affinity scope, the, the affinity strictness, the CPU mask. There's also a concurrency limit parameter and there is a, a niceness. And so the default affinity scope 
since kernel 6.5, I think, is per cache line, which is great. It used to be per NUMA node. Uh, per cache line is really what you want. Uh, so let's use this Dragon debugger to query the running kernel, which uh, work queue uh, pool this NVMe work queue is running in is running in pool 16 on any core. And this demo seems maybe a little bit slow, but that's because this work queue dump produces a huge amount of information and I'm just grepping out a little bit of it to make a point. Here we're asking Dragon to print out which other work queues are running in pool 16 and the answer is there's a whole bunch of them. And as I said, they're unrelated. Uh, here's uh, some DRM ones, some graphics ones, the NVMe ones, Thunderbolt, EDAC, and so forth. Uh, so there's quite a variety of work going on there. Uh, now I'm echoing minus four into the niceness parameter, just a random value. So neither zero nor minus 20. And now we'll ask Dragon which pool work queue is this NVMe uh, work queue running in now? And it's now running in 18. So there didn't used to be a key worker U18. The kernel has actually created this new pool because there were no work queue pools that matched this uh, minus four attribute. And so which other work queues are running in pool 18? The answer, as you should know, is nothing. So now um, this work queue has its own, its own kernel thread. Is this a good thing? I, I would guess probably not. This is probably not something you wanna do, but I'm just illustrating how by setting properties on the, um, on the work instead of the K worker, you can actually configure the system. So I think I'm gonna skip past this since I'm running out of time. I'll just say in contrast to software queues, the uh, pace of development and work queues has been kind of breathtaking. It was actually a problem for me in preparing this talk and the new features kept coming out and I wanted to talk about them and, and understand them. Uh, uh, fundamentally, there are performance improvements there are new tools and um, there are a lot of internal plumbing changes. Uh, and so the performance, the configurability and the observability of work queues have all improved in recent kernels. And there even is a new tool in libbpf called wqlat that's not even part of the kernel source that has appeared just in the last month. Now the uh, big headline for 6.9 is that the Tasklet API, which had a use after free problem, has now been converted to use the work queue API. So you might think, oh, Tasklets are no longer soft RQs, they're now work queues. But that's, that's not right. It's just the interface to Tasklets now has changed. And to really drive that home, I show you this code, which one could call a disgusting heuristic, which now appears in the kernel workq.c, where it has been copied from kernel softirq.c. So the good news is these, all these cool observability tools that you can use to tell what work queues are doing, you now will be able to use them with softirqs. That, that will be really super great. However, the bad news and the good news from some point of view since soft RQs work great when they, when they work great, is that um, they're still soft RQs and they have the advantages and disadvantages there. So uh, the documentation, uh, the documentation for work queues also is great. Uh, it says that bottom half work queue, which is sort of what we're calling tasklets now, are a convenience interface to soft RQs. They are, they are still soft RQs. But who knows, maybe there's a hope there for the future. So to just summarize, software queues are high rate, uh, low latency when things are working well. In uh, voluntary preemption kernels, they run in interrupt context and uh, they have to be re-entrant because the same software queue can be running on every core, even though only one is running on a given core at any given time. 
uh, tasklets I haven't really had time to talk about, but they're a given tasklet only runs one on the, once on the system at any given time. So they're um, similar to software queues, except now they have this work queue API and they don't need to be reentrant. And then work queues are potentially high rate, but less critical latency. They always run in process uh, context. And they have this remarkably sophisticated concurrency um, automated management system which you can enjoy and very good observability tools. So to wrap everything up, um, software queues, um, people have worked so hard for so long to try to improve them. Things have maybe gotten a little bit better and there's hope with this local scoped locks, which is actually called local lock BH nested uh, that uh, maybe uh, there will be an opportunity to remove some instances of uh, local bottom half disable, the big software queue lock. And with Daniel Bristow, Diallo Vera's uh, RTLA, there now is some improved observability. So do, do go hear uh, Daniel's talk tomorrow if you're interested in this topic. But overall, there's been a lot of frustration with software queues. Uh, work queues, on the other hand, are more configurable more performant and easier to observe in recent kernels. So with that, I'd like to thank uh, Sarah Newman for her suggestions about, um, about this talk. I'll say there's a lot of resources here in these slides if you want to follow up. Um, and as I said, you can download these. I made a whole bunch of demos I don't have time to show, but if you want to run them on your own system, you can just download it and uh, try it yourself. So. Thank you for your attention. And uh, if anybody has any energy left before we all go and drink beer, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Can I ask you a question offline? OK. My favorite kind of beer is Hefeweizen. <laughs> All right, well, uh, it must be the end of day. Thanks, everybody, for uh, coming, and uh, be happy to answer anybody's questions or apologize for my mistakes uh, in private as well. workers to a certain CPU. But why would you want to? <laughs> but you didn't mention it because you ran out of time, right? Well, I mean, you could, but given that the system... I mean, you, you had a problem where um, you had most likely uh, RT task, and the worker didn't, wasn't scheduled for like seconds you mentioned, right? Well, the real problem was that the system had uh, lock on cleanliness, and uh, it actually was just locked. I had a driver just lock up. Ah, okay. Because the point is, if you would like um, isolate a CPU by shuffling everything away, sure. Then you could, because there is the CPU mask uh, feature for cable, where you could say exclude the CPU. So even the agreed. Unbounded. So you're aware of this? Because well, I kind of, I kind of said that. I showed in Sysfast there's a CPU yeah, I, mask. Yeah, I said you, I've seen that, but you wait quick over it. So I wasn't sure if you realized it or just didn't mention because. Right, but you're pinning the work queue, not the K-worker. That's the main point I was making, right? Because you're, you're not using task set to pin the K-worker. Exactly. You, you pin the work exactly. and you get a K-worker. Exactly. That's what I want to leave people with because, oops, why don't I turn off the microphone?